Welcome to our budget number three workshop. What is today's date? April 11th. April 11th. Okay. It's been a long day. All right. Can I have a motion <laughs> to open the meeting, please? So moved. So moved. Mike, second. Second. Linda, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Mr. Freeman. All righty. Welcome to budget <laughs> workshop number three this evening. Uh, we have a fairly simple agenda this evening with three topics um say that a little tongue-in-cheek because could state aid and tax rate projections ever be that simple uh but really just going to focus on three things uh this evening and a thought first we'll dive into state aid um do a little kind of uh historical look a little bit more learning uh about some of the state aid too uh woven into the presentation but uh, i want to focus first on foundation aid and because uh, that was a big deal this year um, so what is it? What is it? Why the big deal? Started in 1993, uh, claimed inadequate funding for New York schools. It was a lawsuit. 2003 was upheld by the Court of Appeals. And in 2007, all the way back to former Governor Elliot Spitzer, a plan was created for foundation aid and a formula designed that consolidated what was previously 17 categories of aid into one formula. So how did they get there? And why is it important? Because this is, we're kind of coming full circle now. It studied the spending levels of districts that were meeting key state assessment standards and pretty much what they call, uh, what did a successful school spend to get to be successful? Um, established averages to be funded by local dollars and state dollars, some of which you saw in the formula we uh, talked about earlier. And the whole purpose was is to consolidate those 17 categories into one unrestricted, not tied to anything funding. Okay? And then I just thought I'd share, look at the historical picture for Webster, of what that looks like, um, going all the way back to when it was first uh, created. So the gray is for every year, um, including this year, 22, 23, what the full amount would be if the district, if the formula went, this is how much money we would have gotten. Um, and then the kind of orangish hued bar, how it looks on your computer screen, um, is what we actually got for that year. And then the blue is part of the formula. It's called the base amount. You can see the first couple years of it, it lagged um, getting going. Um, but this formula base then in 11-12 jumped to um, pretty much be even with what we were receiving. And then just as a reminder, right around 9-10, 10-11, the Great Recession, that actual orange bar actually came down by what was called the gap elimination adjustment. Um, so we actually didn't even get that amount, but I just wanted to look at it from a pure foundation aid perspective um, for you guys to kind of get the feel of where this has been and where it's gone. So you can see a couple of years we had some very high amounts that we were due, um, and then it dipped back down. You see um, as the formula nuances work, um, it, it changes from year to year. So what now, uh, I believe, is a question that has been posed a couple different times uh, throughout the budget process because this has been such a huge part, you probably got blasted emails all the time from all the different uh, statewide groups uh, about foundation aid. So for us, 23-24 and many other suburban districts, what you'll see is we're kind of like the last group to get fully funded. It's the last year of the three-year phase in. Um, foundation aid is the largest portion of our state aid. It's roughly 62.5% given, given any year right around there of our total state aid pot. 62 and a half of it is uh, foundation aid. So immediately in the near future, I know that's kind of clumsy, but it kind of makes sense. What's happening immediately coming up is based on the formula. Um, it has a 3% guarantee increase year after year going forward. So this was like the moment 23, 24 school districts have been waiting for. The formula is finally fully funded. What happens next? Like what's this great unknown? Formula guarantees 3% year after year. Um, so based on our current amount, it's about $1.3 million. If you just keep the 3%, it would generate 1.3. But enrollments change, consumer price index plays into the formula, and um, other factors, other weightings can increase that overall amount further. 
So one year, like this year, uh, we'd probably get three plus eight would be an 11% because of the consumer price index. It probably wouldn't work out to be a pure 11%, but you know, think about it as you know, in the basic mathematical terms. Um, if we had an influx of you know, a bump in secondary students, those kids are weighted more. Um, so that would change the formula as well when it, when it spits out at the end. So there is that nuance year after year. So what are we doing? We're waiting on the state budget right now. Um, there is strong movement to reevaluate the formula. Um, both houses have it set aside, and SED is a huge fan of this. They've requested the money to create a statewide group to update the formula. It's over 20, it's about probably 20 years old. A lot of the data points are 20, point, 20 years old based on some outdated census information. So uh, there's money to kind of reevaluate. Maybe it'll change, maybe it'll stay the same. So some changes on the horizon there. What would help the formula? You know, keeping the minimum increase, especially with mandate increases. Um, you know, we're, every, anytime the state does something, it always seems to roll down and, and be a cost. You know, every time they look at minimum wage or anything else we have to do. So keeping a minimum to help offset those would be great. CPI would be huge because we fluctuate our pricing, our commodities we purchase fluctuates with that as well. So keeping some kind of, you know, benchmark to that would be great. And then updating the economic data points would be great as well. Brian, on the chart that showed the gray bars, if the, if the foundation formula is roughly the same for 30 years, what drove the big change from 2009, 2010 for the next five years when it kept going down? So if you're looking at this right here, the 2009-10? Yeah, that what, was the peak. Right, so that was the us. peak. That was like how the formula originally was designed. There was some catch up in there. Okay. Like, so, uh, like all right, based on the original enrollment data, it really caught us at the peak of Webster growth. So those 07, 08, 08, 09, 09 10, um, 10, 11 are direct correlation to like those three years previous where we were, you know, two high schools at you know, the largest capacity we've ever had. Got it. And then the changes coming back down, or some of that is that topping off and, and plateauing. It also coincides with Governor Cuomo coming in and... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's, I think one of the first things he, he, he said specifically was is, okay, I don't have to enforce this. You know, it's, it's like he took it from the attorney general's lens that he used to have and be like, okay, you know, it was a court ruling. I'm the executive. I don't really have to follow it, you know, of the Andrew Jackson mold. <laughs> Didn't think you were going to get a little history in this yeah. thing, did you? <laughs> I'm loving your historical references right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... Here is what was released uh, for the county, all the schools, what, 22, 23, and then 23, 24. I have this sorted by dollar increase, who got the largest and who got the lowest, and what that percent was. Um, so it's, it's sorted by largest dollar to um, smallest dollar amount. And I have an arrow pointing to the amount they say we're going to get for this reason. Ooh, wrong button. This is the number I honestly believe we will be around. Um, it's a little, a, about $2 million less. Um, what I'm projecting, I believe the state number to be overinflated um, based on um, early indications of some of that not possibly being real money and being um, kind of a negotiating ploy as part of this budget process. Um, to overinflate some of our numbers. What our number holds back to is what our true three year phase in amount should have been this year. So I, I lined it for, uh, you could call it conservative budgeting practices or trying to be as realistic as possible. What we were expecting last year at this time for the final phase in year and not um, take this run uh, at face value, because I don't, and 
December when the formula and all the data points get released after the fiscal year start and be like, oh, so we're not getting $44 million like they projected and we're only gonna get 42.4. We're now short that fiscal year by over $2 million. So wanted to point that out. Um, and I think a lot of other districts are also taking the same tact with these numbers. Um, you know, those are some monster increases that, and, you know, are they believable, are they not? It, it's tough to determine. So just wanted to point that out. <coughs> So, Brian, is there any rationale why there's such a discrepancy between the school districts? Like, what's their second largest? You would expect we should have gotten the second largest increase? In it was all what was owed from the, from the Delta. Okay. Um, so, as you can see, you know, a couple districts are at the bottom with smaller percentages. Um, I left Rochester out because it just skews the data. Um, sure. You know, I'll, and the form, yeah. So, um, you know, I could use Brighton. Um, you know, they got the largest percentage increase in comparative. Um, a lot of it has to do with the economics. What is their property value? What's been their reported income that fluctuates those internal numbers to maybe change things a little bit? Um, and what kind of everything with the state is usually broken into buckets and tiers um, it's oh it's what old school is called the shares methodology here's the state aid pot here's Long Island's here's New York City's here's the Hudson Valley here's the Finger Lakes and here's you know where nobody ever goes to visit um, <laughs> so it's like broke it like these pies so a lot of districts the way the formula is written is to see which part of the pie you're gonna go into and so that's why you see, uh, you know, Greece and Rush Henrietta, their economics is a big reason why. Um, you know, Rush Henrietta is an anomaly when it comes to economics. They have a pretty high poverty rate, but their combined wealth ratio is higher than ours because they have so much commercial real estate, it offsets their income. So the formula kind of like balances it out. And actually they have so much property value, it offsets you know, a lower income value, which derives the formula. So it's a complicated formula. I remember you showing us, right? <laughs> That's an easy way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, you know, there's, there's nuances, and everybody's pretty unique when it comes to that formula. Thank you. So that's foundation aid. Then the rest of state aid we're going to look at is the expense-based aids updates. Remember, these are all based on enrollment or expenditure amounts when we report. So just going to run through those for you. The first one up is transportation aid. Um, governor gave us this estimate. I got a question mark. You'll see that theme for the legislative estimate. Um, really nothing's changing. I'm projecting uh, will be $7 million based on what we're going to end the year at expense-wise. Our aid rate hasn't changed to create any kind of wide swaths. Remember, that's based on an August projection, which is assuming pretty much we're spending every dollar of our budget, which we know we don't. So transportation aid will come somewhere around about $7 million is what we're estimating for next year. Uh, BOCES aid, same thing. It, that is a very early in the fall. Hey, this is what BOCES says we're going to spend and what we're going to get. We get fluctuations throughout the year. Um, the legislature is more than likely 99.9% .9 positive. They're not going to change the formula. There is no indication anything's going to change. So our aid rate's stable here. Based on what I think June 30th we're going to spend and what that rate is, we're going to pull in about $6 million of BOCES aid. Next up is building aid. This is one of the ones where works in reverse for us. Um, we had 7.1 on the governor, the same you know, kind of concept. The governor at the time doesn't have those final building cost reports when they do the projection. I'm actually projecting we're gonna be at $9.9 .9 million for next year because we submitted a bunch of those final cost reports in December of 23 and we will be submitting next year in December 24, which will give us more aid during that fiscal year as well based on completion of the um, 2018 project. So that's one where they are way under uh, what the actual projection is. 
um, compared to the data instead of being over because that's actually a different reporting portal than the other ones. So very simple, Mike, not complicated at all. <laughs> <laughs> this one I wanted to spend a little bit more time on to talk about excess cost aids because it was part of budget workshop number two and where do we get these estimates from and what happens and kind of tie it all together for you guys. Um, so the governor's estimates, those were, you know, this one's based on student enrollment, don't have a legislature. My estimate is $1.65 million based on what I think all of our BOCES and private placements are going to be. Um, but the question, Brian, why wouldn't it be going up? In workshop number two, you said your mouse wasn't going to work. Let me close this and show you. I have workshop number two somewhere around here. Right here on this slide, we had tuition going up for private placements. So shouldn't that mean we get more aid? We will in one year from now. It's on a delay. Just want to point that out. It's not a year to year match. So we'll spend this with these, uh, the two extra kids or two extra um, students we were uh, estimating. That will be spent in 23-24. If that comes to fruition, those two students stay the whole year, we will see that aid in the 24-25 school year. So just wanted to point that out, that that's how these are tied together, um, these formula fundings. All right, and then just to kind of explain how that formula works too, because it's a little bit unique. So say that student A costs $100,000 in tuition at a BOCES program or a day treatment center or um, Norman Howard. The state first does this. They're telling us based on formula, the first $43,278, it's on you guys, it's on the district. Um, that's our, what we call our threshold. It's a local threshold. It's three times our average operating expense per student. Um, and then so we have a remaining cost. You take that 100,000 minus what is our local and then the state multiplies that by their state aid ratio, 56% in this case. So this one student that's $100,000 tuition will generate excess aid of 31,764. So when we try to project out, we, we pretty much get all the kids, run them through a projection like this, and that's where we get our aid number from. So I just thought it'd be a good, you know, this is one we haven't spent time on talking about, get into the weeds of how that formula actually works, but this is how the state gives us excess aid for students with disabilities in these programs. Questions on that? And they have to stay an entire year? Like if they left? We'll get partial. We'll get partial. Yeah. It, it, so it's yep. prorated. It is okay. prorated. Yep. Okay. And then the last is the instructional materials aid. Not a lot of changes there. Um, imagine we're going to be slightly above the governor's rate based on our enrollment. And these are, you know, this is the textbook aid, the software aid. Um, that we have discussed before, library book aid. Okay. So here's what our numbers look like. Um, I've got a two year look back there for you, plus the governor's run, you know, a little confused on the legislative run there, highlighted for you. Like I said, not <laughs> anticipating any changes. Um, if you look to the far right, you know, I've highlighted one thing it's UPK. Um, that always gets reported in our runs, but remember, that's a grant. Um, so right. like if, you know, we get this huge influx of UPK money, like they are actually, the governor projected or something changes, we don't have to change the budget, we don't have to amend anything because it is a grant. They just like to show it as a state aid. So it, it gets accounted for entirely separate. So I just wanted to highlight that for you too. So you see those numbers there of uh, where everything is. Um, no impact on w if that changes, but we're locking the far right in as what we uh, project our state aid to be for next year. Um, and then I just 
talk a little bit about the state budget impacts. You know, like I said, on the expense based, no change. Um, really safe to predict where that's coming from. Foundation Aid uh, talked a little about what that set aside is. And that, you know, we have to, um, you know, we, we kind of have to plant that flag in the ground uh, with making uh, a decision. Do we count it? Do we not count it? Is it going to be there? Um, because one thing that does not change for us regardless is our budget deadlines. Um, so our adoption date, what we have to certify, when all the materials get out, when we have to vote, that never changes. We don't get to put one week extenders on it until the, like the legislature does. So this was actually like the practice I learned going back 13, 14, 15 years ago. This happened all the time. So like districts would have to, you know, plant that stake, make a firm decision on what the budget was going to be. And the state budget, sometimes they get passed till June, July, or August. Um, so then maybe do budget amendments over the summer. Um, we've been pretty lucky the last decade or so um, where that hasn't happened. We've had firm, accurate numbers to, um, to rely on. Still think we'll get there before formal budget adoption next week. I think we'll have something. So if there's any radical changes that come out, which not projecting, um, we'll have some time to adjust if, if need be and, and, and work through that from there. But um, yeah, it's, we've, it's been a while. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody up here has been on the board when that was kind of the norm. Um, so, but that was the norm just short as a couple governors ago. So um, that's where we're at with the state aid and what I think will, will go on. Questions on anything state aid or anything before we jump into the next, you know, fun topic, mm -hmm. tax projections? So Brian, you have to have expenses and revenue matched. <clears throat> if for some reason, Right. It's a big if, but if for some reason we end up with four million more in revenue, all the higher numbers that you put lower numbers in come to fruition, and the higher number for the capital part um, comes to fruition or building aid, we end up with four million. Do you reduce the tax levy on the revenue side, or do you increase, say, contributions to reserves on the expense side to balance it? What, what are your options for balancing? At that so point? my first question is, are you talking solely about the expense-based aids? Like the transportation aid, the building aid? Yeah, I'm saying you put in lower numbers than what the governor had. Yeah, and a couple of them, them and right? a couple of and them had higher numbers. I'm saying if all the, they all work in our favor, so you end up with four million more from the state. Well, it's not that we're gonna end, we would end up with four million more. We would end up as close to actual what i'm budgeting is based on what i think is actually going to happen not based on what the governor is projecting there so in actuality if i go back and just um i'll use this so like i'll use building aid that's the easiest one Ugh, sensitive to that um <laughs> like that's the governor said we're going to get 7.1 so if I agreed with the governor and put 7.1 over there, we'd be less $2 million on the budget side. But I know when everything comes out from reporting next December, we're really going to be at 9.9. .9. So that would be a way you could have that $2 million towards the $4 million. But we're really going to be at 9.9 .9 come next December. Um, you know, same thing like BOCES. You know, I'm projecting six, they're at six, four, eight. So, you know. But you have to have the numbers match, right, when you submit it. So if you're only getting 7.1, or they don't have to match. Revenue doesn't have to match expenses when you submit the final budget for- Well, it has level. to submit, yes, at budget to budget, they have to zero out, right. But, you know, I don't think- Okay, I've Good. ever Yeah, I've ever seen the final, like when we get our audit, that we're, hey, you were dead on or you're dead on. You know, yeah. usually you're two to three percent on each side. Hopefully it's to the good or not to the negative. You make it work throughout the year. Yeah. So, okay. but yeah, I just want to make sure to your original question is like, what happens if that influx comes in 
maybe they're delayed until June. We've already passed the budget, we've already set up. What happens if all of a sudden they say, hey, we decided to give everybody $4 million then, we could, you could, you know, there are legal things, you could pass a budget resolution um, that you don't have to go back out to voters and say, late state budget, here's the resolution, we're going to recognize $4 million more in state aid that we did not have on May 16th uh, this year or have any knowledge. And you can say, all right, we are going to add and e expand the budget because we want X, Y, and Z. These were the next things up on the list or we're gonna put some of it towards the tax warrant in August, or vice versa. So those would be, that's, you know, that's exactly what would happen 20 years ago. Late budget in June, you, you'd be conservative on what you think you're getting this from the state, the state passes their budget, they say, okay, now we know we're giving you this amount. Boards of education would have that decision. Do we want to increase our budget through a resolution and hire five more teachers or do X, Y, and Z? Or are we gonna lower the warrant in August? Okay. So. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All righty, tax levy limit. Um, no update, exactly the same as February. I'm just gonna show you that real quick have that ready to go. So what we presented, this is our tax cap from February, showing no changes, not, we've had no input changes, everything's been standard and uniform. I do have it linked here too as well to take you to there. So to try to project out what our budget would do for tax rates, um, you know, we're four months away, um, so we got a, a lot of time for things to happen. Um, the three parts of the formula that we go through every summer, um, one is controlled, the assessments by local assessors, the equalization rates are state controlled, and then we control the tax levy. So we have a third of the, the pie, um, per se. And then um, we also have all this information on the website about our tax information that we update all the time. Um, so just as a reference of where you could find a lot <coughs> of the data and information. So Webster's three parts. Um, this is our levy uh, that we're projecting, 2.4, um, 3% increase. Now when I run the estimates, I'm backing out $75,000. So our levy will actually be reduced by 75,000 because every June the, um, the assessors turn over to us re-levies that get added. It's previous uh, unpaid tax bills for a number of reasons. Um, they're getting re-levied as part of this year. So that gets subtracted because we're gonna get that money anyway. So we're not double counting it. And then equalization, uh, which is the fun part of the formula currently and has created um, a lot of the angst around taxes in, uh, regionally lately um, because of the home market values and what's happening. So first off the bat is Webster. We are currently at a 64% uh, last week. Um, the state released initial. It looks like on the initial, which could change, they have us for 58%, so a 6% drop before we even get started. Uh, Penfield, they just did a whole reassessment. They were at 100% for one year. They just are dropping 6% down to 94. And I guess the short way to say this is the state is saying, oh, yep, you did a reassessment, but guess what? You're 6% below market value. You know, we're 42% below market value in Webster. Uh, Ontario and Walworth are huge drops. Uh, both were at 94, Ontario going to 84, and Walworth going to 82. Re these are preliminary uh, from the New York State Office of Real Property. They have the ability to change these right up through the middle of August um, and finalize them. So, you know, quite often the last, the middle of August, I'm running around calculating taxes five times a day because we get changes that happen um, 
from this and from, from the assessments. So that's going to be a huge, huge impact if those come to fruition uh, before we even put in the levy. Um, that's a huge drop in those towns. And then what are assessments going to do? Because they never stay flat. So uh, took a look at those mathematically. Uh, Webster, I utilized the 10-year average because it's been pretty consistent. So mathematically, I felt confident in that one. They're at 1%. Um, that's where they've been on average for 10 years. The other three were not so much when you look at the average. So I actually extended that out to 25 years and looked at the median because Penfield, Walworth, and Ontario have had so many ups and downs. Um, it would, it's skewed if you use average. Um, so went mathematically with the median there to see what would happen. And ta-da. Before I do that, here's my 100% guarantee <laughs> that these will change in August. <laughs> not going to hide it, but not going to. Yeah. Electronically signed. Yes. <laughs> so predictions aren't that hard to make, especially those in the future, huh? Yeah. I know it. Yeah, my best Yogi Berra right here. That's right. Um, <laughs> you got it right, though. Your prediction. <laughs> yeah. um, it has been a roller coaster with some of the, uh, trying to, you know, get this moving target uh, with some of the changes and what's going on uh, with those equalization rates. Th those are some uh, baffling drops. You know, historically we're used to like a two percent change per year, but seeing six to ten percent drops is is pretty significant. And it's hard to explain because school districts are the only ones that have this as part of their tax calculation. You know, town of Webster, when you pay town taxes or the county, you're paying one entity. It's one calculation. Um, but for school districts, we cross counties and we cross towns. So the state tries to equalize it. So Ontario matches Webster for the same type of house. Um, it's, uh, it's not... Um, easy uh, concept to kind of uh, grasp and, and work through with people when that happens. Um, it's a conversation I had a lot with people in the town of Penfield uh, with when they had their reassessment. You know, you, you guys are 27% of the district, you know, from a global tax calculation perspective. I got to wait to see what Webster does because that's going to impact you more than that reassessment because you know, they're 72%. So a lot of changes. Here's my best guess. Penfield's the big winner again. Lowest tax rate on the east side of Monroe County. The town of, well, actually in all of Monroe County, I believe, um, um, is to live in the town of Penfield in the Webster Central School District. The day Webster does their reassessment is the day everybody does not want to live in the town of Penfield on the Webster side. <laughs> because those numbers will do a because right now, every time Webster's equalization rate goes down, it subsidizes a lower amount for the town of Penfield. Um, Ontario and Walworth, um, those equalization rate decreases really um, are overall hurting them. And as the equalization rate goes lower for everybody, that actually drops our true tax rate when you compare, because it's, it's a much larger market value um, compared to our levy than what the assessed value is. So I don't know how confident I feel mathematically, pretty good. Um, but there's a lot more art to this than <laughs> right now <laughs> than I, I feel comfortable in uh, dissecting. Is Webster planning on doing a 100% reassessment in the near future? Um, it's been talked about. Uh, I think this point that, I mean, the equalization rate being at 58, I would imagine it's got to be in stages rather than one fell swoop because that, that's, a, that's a lot to, to overcome. Um, so I don't which, know. Which is something they're considering Mike is doing in stages is the last I heard anyways in my conversations with the town. Okay. It was a question from the DeWitt Road PTSA. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Might have to hire somebody for the office just to handle the paperwork that will come in in the month of August and September on that one mm -hmm. when that does happen. Yeah. Some seasonal help. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. I'm going to try to find it. <coughs> Somebody who understands taxes. Yeah. <laughs> You're more than welcome to apply, Mr. Swanson. <laughs> and then lastly, um, you know, state aid and uh, tax revenue make up a little over 90%. So what's the other 10%? Um, really six major revenue streams. Sales tax, projecting that to remain stable. We haven't, uh, you know, we added more to that. We've seen a bump excuse me, because of online um, sales tax revenue. So um, no projection on that changing uh, next year. Pilots, those payments in lieu of taxes, uh, not a lot of changes there. Uh, we'll have one pilot um, coming off the books and one coming on to replace it, so those will balance it out. And those are just agreements that we have no say in as reference for everybody that come from what used to be Comita, it's now called Imagine New York. You know, people that want to start a new business or new enterprise petition to get a 10 year tax break and they vary from uh, business to business of uh, reduction in taxes. So that's uh, what a payment in lieu of tax is, promised jobs or promised something in response to, to get the tax break. Um, fund balance, we're maintaining the same level of appropriated fund balance as previous years to reduce the tax levy. Remember, we've kept that uniform for many years now. Those were previous monies that have been allocated um, in August under those situations, Mike, that we described earlier. Um, when you had the decisions in August, like, oh, we got a little extra money, what are we going to do? Many years, uh, they've just added to the appropriated fund balance to reduce the levy. So we're keeping that uniform. Reserves, this budget does allow us to eliminate any need for reserve allocations. Um, this is a major, major win for long-term financial stability to have a budget uh, with no reserves as part of getting to zero. Um, interest rates have increased, but there is so much volatility when we looked at that from quarter to quarter right now. Um, we're liable to see them come back down during the fiscal year next year. So I want to take a wait and see approach with that uh, before we look at changing that budget number. You know, monitor that, see what happens. Um, you, know, you know, are we going to get 5% like we are now on some of our investments? You know, I feel like that escalated so quickly it could decelerate very quickly too during mm -hmm. the fiscal year. So I want to take a look at longer term and get a little bit more stability there. And then our miscellaneous, uh, not a lot of changes. That's our just usage revenues for continuing ed. Um, you know, aquatics, um, facilities, rentals, um, some refunds from BOCES, things like that are all just tied up in miscellaneous. So what do the final numbers look like when we put it all together? Um, you can see there, it's what our sales tax staying stable, our state increase we talked about, our rental, prop, what we get um, from renting out our facilities, our interest staying stable, Pilots staying stable, the miscellaneous revenue staying stable, weaning ourselves off that last 500,000 transfer from the ERS, maintaining the appropriate fund balance, property tax levy, uh, staying cap compliant, gives us to our total revenues. And then the moment, one of the moments we've all been waiting for, <laughs> here is our budget to budget increase comparisons. Now I've left all the other districts because they haven't formally adopted um, blank. Um, our budget increase is 4.4%. That hasn't changed since workshop two. The average in the county right now is 5.66. So we're actually 1.25% uh, below the county average. You can see they range from anywhere just about 3% to close to 9.7 is the highest budget to budget increase this year, which is not unexpected. Got a significant bump in foundation aid. Some districts have been holding back for several years on doing some stuff. So you're seeing the budget to budget increase there. So just wanted to show that as uh, kind of a benchmark of where you know our percents are compared to everybody else. And our budget is a balanced formula. Our revenues match in our budget. We have no surplus, we have no deficit. We got to zero. Um, so budget is balanced. Uh, just some Upcoming dates, uh, April 18th is formal budget adoption. Actually, that is, um, you know, we 
have probably, if anything, major changes. We have to legally adopt by the 24th this year. Um, so gives us a couple days if something major happened, but not anticipating that. We have to get our budget materials out by May 1st. Our budget hearing's the 2nd, and the vote is the 16th. Thank you, and I've put the link to our budget website, everything and anything that is our budget, including the thought exchange, links to our state report card, then every presentation, uh, every legal document to be disclosed is living right here for anybody to take a look at. Thank you. Yeah, Very thank thorough. you, Ryan. Thank, thank you. you. Yay, yes. Okay. I give Mr. Swenson all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Dave. Yes, we should. And we have guests for the next one.